All right. We're going to talk about how organic farming can contribute to cli climate change mitigation. Let me know if uh, you can't hear me. Is this close enough? All right. And I also just want to give you a heads up. The laser pointer doesn't work on this screen, which I am highly reliant on. So I'm going to try to use my words and talk you through some graphs. Um, but that's what's going on there. Today, um, I'm going to talk to you one about uh, climate change. And when we think about climate change, why do we need to consider agriculture? So typically, somebody says global warming, and we think about cars, we think about airplanes, we think about smokestacks and industry. We don't think about farms. So what is the role that our food systems and our farms uh, play when we're talking about climate change? I'm going to present some key studies to you um, that really demonstrate how organic farming can contribute to climate change mitigation. And then I'm going to focus really um, heavily on one study in particular that looks at sequestered carbon in organic farms. And then I'm going to close by talking to you a little bit about how these same practices that can contribute to climate change mitigation can also increase agricultural resiliency when we're talking about adaptation to some of the challenges that we're expected to face due to climate change. Okay, so 40% of the Earth's ice-free surface is used for agricultural production. And in Canada, 167 million acres are devoted to agriculture. And this map really allows us to visualize the extent of that coverage. So when you look at this, basically any of the land area that's covered in brown is land that's devoted to range or cropland. And you can see that with the exception of our ice-free surfaces, or ice-covered surfaces to the far north, and our major biomes such as the Amazon rainforest and the Sahara Desert, a huge proportion of our land surfaces are devoted in one way or another to agriculture. Now with the growing population that's expected to reach 9 billion by 2050, our ability to mitigate climate change is going to rest in our ability to sustainably manage agricultural lands that are already under production. So agriculture is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, food systems contribute about 30% of our global man-made greenhouse gas emissions. And agricultural production uh, contributes to about 80% of those total food system emissions. And these greenhouse gas emissions contribute directly to climate change. So when we think about climate change and agriculture, um, there's really two ways that we can be part of the solution and two ways that we can be part of the problem. Um, the first is by either increasing or reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And the second is by either releasing or sequestering carbon in our soils. So when we talk about agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, we typically, typically classify them as either direct emissions or indirect emissions. So a direct emission is basically an emission that is emitted on the farm. So a prime example would be on-farm fossil fuel combustion to run tractors or irrigation pumps. It also includes methane release from livestock and livestock waste, uh, and nitrous oxide release from the use of soil fertility management practices, such as synthetic fertilizers, um, but also manure and legumes. Now, indirect emissions are emissions that are directly related to agricultural production, but they are not necessarily emitted on the farm. Um, so these include things like carbon release due to land conversion. So for instance, if we take out a forest or a prairie to convert that to ag land, the carbon that was once sequestered in that plant material above and below the ground, so the leaves and the trunks and the roots, um, that will decompose on that carbon dioxide. Most, most of that carbon will make its way back into the atmosphere. Um, and another really major uh, indirect emission is fossil fuel use for the manufacture and transport uh, of on-farm inputs. And in particular, um, the manufacture of synthetic ammonium nitrate fertilizer 
is a huge source of indirect emissions. So when we talk about this, um, what's happening is when we produce these synthetic fertilizers, we need a source of hydrogens for that chemical reaction that happens. Um, and that chemical reaction, the hydrogen atoms usually come from natural gas or methane. So when we say that it is very energy intensive and greenhouse uses or creates a lot of greenhouse gases to create fertilizers, we're not talking about simply it uses a lot of energy to run that manufacturing plant. Um, we actually need fossil fuels as an input, as an ingredient to create that final product, those synthetic uh, fertilizers. So then we can flip that coin and we can talk about soil carbon. So these are results from a recent study um, where researchers modeled the global loss of carbon from our agricultural soils. Um, and the way that you, this map looks similar to the last one that I showed you, except for more colorful. Um, so the way that you read this is basically any land area that's yellow, orange, or red is land where we've lost carbon due to agricultural production. And then areas with blue and green are areas where there has been some carbon gain. And so what they found was overall, the Earth has lost 133 billion metric tons of carbon in our top two meters of soil globally. And that that rate of loss has been increasing dramatically over the last 200 years. And that increase is largely due to the conversion of natural ecosystems to agricultural land, and also due to the intensification of our farming systems. But it doesn't have to be this way. So fortunately, uh, soil is a renewable resource. And so we can uh, you know, put carbon back into the soil. Um, so soil uh, scientists have, have estimated that by restoration of degraded soils, we can sequester between one and three billion tons of carbon annually. That is a conservative estimate. And that would offset about 11 to 32% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. So we know that large-scale industrial agriculture is contributing to climate change, um, and it is depleting the carbon in our soils. And two of the most detrimental practices that are used is the overuse of synthetic fertilizers and the failure to incorporate uh, organic matter back into the soils. Conversely, uh, there's a growing body of research which really suggests that, that practices that are commonly used by organic farmers um, can contribute to climate change mitigation by increasing energy efficiency, by increasing carbon sequestration, and by um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So some of these practices include the use of buffers and hedgerows. So this conserves soil carbon. Um, it prevents it from physical loss due to erosion. And the use of extended crop rotations. And the use of manure, compost, and legumes for soil fertility. And so this has two benefits. One, these practices are used in place of synthetic fertilizers, which, as I mentioned, are very energy inefficient. They use a lot of fossil fuels. Um, but they also uh, put organic matter back into the soil. OK, so now I'm going to transition, and I'm going to show you some data that support these assertions. Um, so this is research that came out of the University of Illinois, and they were comparing soil health in nine long-term farming systems trials across the United States. And so each of these trials included plots that were organic, that utilized both manure and legumes for soil fertility. Um, another one was organic and utilized only legumes, and then the third was conventional. And all of these plots utilized tillage. So what they found was when they compared the organic uh, manure and legume to the organic legume, there was no statistical difference in the amount of soil organic carbon uh, in those plots. But when they compared the organic plots to the conventional plots, they found that there was a 14% increase in the soil organic carbon in the organic plots as compared to the conventional plots. So that, you know, a lot of people are going to say, yeah, well, conventional farmers are utilizing no-till a lot, and organic farmers are really doing harm to the soil by utilizing tillage. So let's take a look at a study that compares organic till versus conventional no-till. Um, so this is research out of the United States Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Research Service. So this is government research. Um, this is a long-term uh, study that took place. It started in 1996. It's still ongoing. And so what they did that a lot of studies don't normally do is they looked at the organic carbon to a depth of one meter. So most studies look at just at very shallow depths. And so if this is where the pointer would really be awesome. If we, um, 
if we look at that first graph, can everybody see which line is the organic line and which line is the conventional line? Okay, and so the y-axis, which is that vertical axis, that represents soil depth. So the top is zero, so you can think of that as the ground going down to one meter. And then the x-axis, which is at the top, which is that horizontal, that's the amount of soil organic carbon. So it increases as you move right. So you can see that in about, it's the first about eight centimeters, conventional no-till plots do have higher levels of soil organic carbon. But when we look from about eight centimeters down to 40 centimeters, all of a sudden the organic plots have more soil organic carbon. And then from about 40 centimeters down to a meter, there's no statistical difference. And so if we go ahead and sum up all those measurements um, in that soil profile, what we see is what I'm showing you in the second graph there, which is that our organic tillage plots still have higher levels of soil organic carbon than those conventional no-till plots. And so they found um, that they this was mostly the case because, again, in, in no-till, your plant residues are being deposited right on the surface, whereas in tillage, you're incorporating them deeper into the soil where they're more resilient to degradation. And so, you know, I'm showing you this. I'm not saying that organic farmers shouldn't be trying uh, to, to till with less frequency. Um, we don't need to till as deep. You know, conservation tillage is good. It's something that we should be working towards. But um, even with tillage, organic is still outperforming compared to a lot of conventional. Okay, so this study uh, was looking at the environmental impact of a loaf of bread. Um, and so what they did is they looked at every step in the process, and this is using primary data. So they, um, scientists actually partnered with a bread company that knew the farm and so they could quantify all of the practices basically from getting the fields ready to planting the wheat all the way down to packing and dispatching and slicing that bread and getting it ready uh, for the supermarket. And so what they found was that, so I'm going to be focusing on the second bar to the right. Um, so that's global warming potential. And what they found was that over half of the environmental impact of bread, when we talk about global warming potential, um, was due to on-farm practices. And then they found that 43% of that total, of the entire impact, that's that big red bar there, that's due to the use of synthetic ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And I, I didn't explain it very well, but each of those horizontal color bars, those represent a different step in the process, essentially. So everything within that bracket, is activities that take place on the farm, and then that uh, big red bar is the effect of um, ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And so this, of course, has nothing to do with organic, uh, because organic farmers don't use synthetic fertilizer, um, but that's one less environmental impact that we don't have. And by we, I mean you. Okay, and this is a study um, out of Canada. So this was basically, it was done in 2008, and they're modeling what would happen if we converted all of the corn, canola, soy, and wheat crops in Canada to organic production. And what they found was that if we did this, on average, uh, crop production would consume 60% less energy. So the way that you read this graph is basically these bars are cumulative energy demand, and we see conventional corn, organic corn, uh, so on and so forth, conventional organic, conventional organic. They also found uh, that by converting, there would be 25% fewer global warming emissions and 80% fewer ozone depleting emissions, and this would lead to a much lower global warming potential. And these um, big changes that we're seeing here are directly related to fertility management. So again, all of this is tied to the, the lack of use of synthetic fertilizers in organic. So overall, you know, those are a couple key studies, um, but generally the research uh, shows us that on average, organic farms have higher levels of soil organic carbon, uh, they're more energy efficient, and a lot of the practices uh, that are being used can, be, uh, can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about carbon sequestration. So these are the results that a uh, of a study that was done by soil chemists at Northeastern University in the United States. Um, and it was done in collaboration with the Organic Center. And this study was a comparison of long-term carbon storage in conventional and organically managed soils. 
Um, so it's the first large-scale study of this kind. Um, and we were specifically looking at carbon that is sequestered in the soil. So, and that means it's held there for long periods of time. So soil organic carbon is important. It's important for carbon sequestration. Um, and it can be broken down into two main pools. So a lot of times you'll just hear total soil organic carbon, um, but it's actually composed of two pools. One of those pools is called the labile pool. This is a pool that's broken down pretty readily by soil microbes, and so it's recycled back into the atmosphere. It's a really important pool of carbon uh, when it comes to soil fertility, but it's not sequestering carbon. And then we have the second pool, which is the stable pool, and we call this humic substances. Um, so humic substances are much more resistant to degradation by microbes, so they can be maintained in the soil for hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. Um, so they're much more important when we're talking about long-term storage of carbon in the soils. And the two primary components of humic substances is humic acid and fulvic acid. But you don't have to remember that right now, I just want you to say, soil organic carbon, two pools, labile pool, turning over rapidly, humic substances, stable, staying put, carbon sequestration. So humic substances are important because, again, they're stable and they are the sequestering components of organic carbon. Um, but they're also linked with higher soil fertility, beneficial soil structure. Um, so there's a lot of other benefits that are associated with them in soils. So we set out to quantify the amount of humic substances uh, from organic and conventional farms to test the hypothesis that org organic soils were better at long-term long carbon sequestration uh, than conventional soils. So previously, um, most studies have not broken down soil organic carbon into these different components, and that's because until recently, the methods haven't existed to do it uh, cheaply and efficiently. Um, so most studies will use either total soil organic carbon, like the previous studies that I showed you, or soil organic matter and then use that as a proxy for carbon sequestration. But because we know that that total soil organic measurement includes that labile pool that's cycling rapidly, we can see how it's not necessarily the best measure of carbon sequestration. So the National Soil Project had developed these methods and they had already done all the research on conventional farms. So they had collected uh, soil samples from 728 farms across the United States um, put together a database, and then we partnered with them to collect soil samples from organic farms. And we managed to bring in 659, I think, yes, samples um, to compare to what they had already done. And I just want to emphasize that our soil collection for both the conventional side and the organic side was, was blindly done. So we didn't reach out to farmers that um, you know, we knew we were using particular soil fertility management practices. We didn't reach out to farmers that we knew were using no-till or were tilling or anything like that. We reached out for organic. We reached out to every single USDA certified organic farmer in the United States. We told them we would give them the results of their soil tests, and we saw what came in. And what we found was pretty striking. Um, so if you look at the bottom left graph, that's soil organic matter. This is a common measurement. So we found that our soils from organic farms had about 13% higher soil organic matter. This is what we expected, and it's in line with previous research. But what's really interesting is the top two graphs. So that's humic acid and fulvic acid. And if you recall, those are the two primary components of humic substances, that stable carbon sequestering pool um, and we found that soils from organic farms had 150% more fulvic acid and 44% more humic acid. Then if you look to the bottom right, you see humification. Um, essentially what that is, is looking at the rate or the proportion of soil organic matter, a total that is converted into humic substances. So we have that total pool of soil organic matter. How much of that is going to go into that labile carbon pool versus how much is going to go into that sequestered pool? And we found that uh, humification was 26% higher in organic soils versus conventional soils. Um, so this study is pretty awesome because it, is, it has a huge sample size and across a broad geographic range. Um, and we're still, you know, in spite of all the variation in farming practices, both in conventional and organic, we're really able to discern the strong statistical effect of practice when it comes to carbon sequestration. Okay, so hopefully, maybe, I've convinced you that 
organic farming in general is pretty good for climate change mitigation. But um, let's be honest, climate change is on our doorstep. It's only expected to get worse. And there's a lot of challenges that are expected to arise for farmers. So now I'm going to kind of take a different turn and talk about how a lot of these same practices can increase agriculture um, and help us adapt to what we expect may happen because of climate change. So things that we expect to happen, we expect more variable pre precipitation, we expect our carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere to rise, uh, we expect it to get warmer, we expect more severe droughts and uh, heavy rain, and all of these are going to have effects on agricultural productivity um, in a number of ways. So higher CO2 and warmer weather, a lot of people might say, yeah, that sounds awesome. Our crops are going to love it. Yes, they will, but uh, so will invasive weeds, so will pests, so will pathogens. Um, so studies have shown us that with warming temperatures and increasing CO2, um, the establishment and persistence of weeds is likely to become a bigger challenge, and pests and pathogens ranges are likely to expand. Um, so this is something that all farmers are going to have to deal with. Okay, so one of the biggest things that organic farmers do um, that increases our climate resiliency um, is focusing on soil health. And so when we talk about soil health, we're talking about nutrients, we're talking about the microbial community, and we're talking about soil organic matter, which is kind of the base of all that. And there's a lot of benefits uh, to having soil organic matter in your soils. Um, so soils that are higher in soil organic matter have reduced erosion. Uh, it protects those soils against compaction. It improves uh, aeration, water filtration, and water holding capacity. And all of these characteristics are going to be really important um, when we're talking about drought or flooding. And then of course it's a reserve for essential nutrients and it supports that microbial community because healthy soil is, is going to be important anytime. So these results are from the Rodale long-term uh, field trial system. Um, and so what they're doing here is they're comparing plots that are under conventional production um, organic production using legumes and organic production using manure. And so what I'm showing you here are basically yields for maize um, during drought years. And so there's uh, six drought years here. Let's look at the first five where like the bars are pretty tall, they're looking normal. If we look at those drought years, we can see that the yields, the corn yields in the, the organic plots uh, exceed the yields in the conventional plots in four out of those five drought years. Um, and that's attributed to higher levels of soil organic matter and better soil health. Now you're probably wondering what's happening in year 99 there. What's going on? Well, that year was a crazy year in the Northeast. So in case you're unaware, these trials are taking uh, place in Pennsylvania, which is the eastern coast of the United States. And the Northeast had a severe drought that year. And then that drought was followed immediately by torrential downpours due to hurricanes. So it's common, our hurricanes, they start in the Caribbean, they come up the East Coast, and they just dump rain on us. So this was severe drought followed by hard, hard rain. So we can see that all of the plots really suffered here. But still, the organic plot that's treated with manure still has 38% higher yields than, the, than those conventional plots. So taken as a whole, this really shows us that soils that are high in organic matter and that are healthy are going to be more resilient to some of these extreme weather events. Okay, and then the other thing that we're worried about is pest and pathog pathogen pressure. Um, and so, again, organic farmers typically use integrative pest management techniques um, to control pests on their farms. And this is a study, these are results from a study um, it was done in Germany. So they're uh, comparing 15 conventional farms, cereal farms, to 15 uh, organic cereal farms. And here what they're doing is they're, they're looking at biodiversity. And here in particular, I'm showing you uh, cereal aphids is what they're looking at. So we can see on the left, there's two bars. Those are the abundance, so the number of cereal aphids um, found in those conventional fields. And then to the right, there's two bars, and those are the number of cereal aphids found in those organic fields. Now you're saying, why are there two bars for each of those? This study also compared uh, the difference in abundance between the edge of the field and the center of the field. 
just as a general rule, uh, research finds that you're going to have higher biodiversity in the edge, along the edge of your fields than the center. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, we can just ignore that and just sort of look at the combined, uh, you know, results there. So what they found was that the abundance of cereal aphids was five times lower in the organic fields. And then they also looked at the natural predators of those aphids. So they looked at a variety of different predators, one of which was the beautiful lady beetle there. Um, and they found that beneficial predator abundances were three times higher in the organic plots. And then when they looked at the predator to prey ratios, they found that they were 20 times higher in the organic fields. And what this shows is that when we support biodiversity and we have robust populations of beneficial predators, this just can provide us with an additional line of defense against emerging pest challenges um, that may be coming with further climate change. So the sort of main take home points here are that organic agriculture can positively impact climate change mitigation through carbon sequestration. Um, it also tends to be more energy efficient, uh, largely through the emission of fossil fuel based fertilizers. And organic practices increase resiliency to climate change. But, you know, I said all this and I gave you all this data that's sort of comparing organic and conventional on average, but in reality, things are complicated, right? So those are the averages, and there's a lot of variation in this data. Um, and in the end, you know, a good land manager is a good land manager. And what that means is that there are a lot of conventional farmers out there that are doing right. They are managing their land really well, and they are contributing to climate change uh, mitigation. They are hosting beneficial biodiversity on their farms. And there are organic farmers out there that are just practicing input substitution, and they're not really doing a good job. So, you know, I'm showing you these averages. I think there's a lot of potential for organic agriculture, but, you know, in the end, it all comes down to individuals and what we're doing on our farms, what you are doing on your farms. <laughs> um, so really, uh, another thing that I want to highlight is that you know, even if we're using best management practices, we need more research to develop those practices on regional, local scales. Because what works in one place isn't necessarily going to work somewhere else. So we know from the research that the slope of your land matters, that the climate you're in matters, that your soil base matters. Um, all of these things, your moisture content in your soil, all of these make a big difference. Uh, so when we're developing best practices, they need to be regional, they need to be local. And that's what I got for you. Thank you.